Hello and welcome to another Hot Rodster review. In this video, I will be continuing my blind review of the manga series, My Hero Academia Vigilantes by reviewing the final performance arc. It was 20 chapters long, spanning from chapters 66 to 85. There is a lot to talk about because this arc was just so amazing. We're nearing the end of the series, so make sure to subscribe so you have my final Vigilante reviews right in your subscription feed. With that being said, let's get into the review. I must have said this at least two times in my previous reviews, but that does not change the fact that this arc was absolutely the best one so far. It definitely exceeded both the Sky Egg arc and the Versus Queen B arc. I finally got that time skip I wanted a couple arcs ago. After the Versus Queen B arc, Koichi's narration led me to assume that there was going to be a massive time skip and there really wasn't. But in the beginning, it became pretty clear that it had been three years since Koichi had become a vigilante. People were finally calling him the Crawler, and he had become so good that he could fight crime with his eyes closed. It was later revealed that he could also move at way quicker speeds, his blasts are much stronger, and not to mention, he can now basically fly. I love that we just jumped right into this new Koichi because we didn't need to see a training arc to show how he improved. It is implied that it was just the product of actively doing this for three years, and that is completely believable. This arc had so much more emotional weight than any of the previous ones. I feel like this is the first arc where Koichi and Kazuo took the spotlight as it all revolved around these characters. In the first half, most of the focus was on Kazuo as we see a lot of it through her perspective. Specifically, there was a lot of emphasis on her romantic feelings for Koichi. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty surprised that this is where the core focus of this arc was. I hardly ever see any romance in shonen anime and manga, so seeing it be so central to the plot of this arc was definitely a different experience for me and I loved it. I vaguely remember in the Sky Egg arc, Midnight told Kazuo that she needed to make her feelings known before it was too late or something like that. And now the deadline was approaching quickly since Makoto revealed her feelings for Koichi. Now I personally feel like this reveal came out of nowhere but when she explained it, it did end up making sense. However, I still feel like this reveal really wasn't for Koichi, it was for Kazuo. We don't really spend time with Koichi to process his feelings on everything, we actually just see how Kazuo felt about it. We see that she felt jealous, heartbroken, useless, and undeserving. It hurt to see her so broken, but I had a bit of hope when I saw that she was learning how to build up the courage to have that difficult conversation with Koichi. When she finally tried to talk to him and saw that he had a tie that Makoto gave him, she ran off crying. That moment in particular stuck out to me because it was very relatable. It took her so long to build up her confidence and self-worth, only for it to come crashing down by something so small and insignificant. Since Makoto gave Koichi the tie, it must have reinforced the idea that she can't compete with someone as beautiful and successful as Makoto. This allowed her manager, who is really number 6 in disguise, to take advantage of her and turn her into B-pop. The introduction to this arc was just so depressing. I wanted Pop to get more attention and for her to become relevant to the story again, and I guess I got what I asked for. I just didn't expect to be so hurt when she was brought back into relevancy. At this point, I believe we switch back over to Koichi's perspective. Once he heard that she was missing, he obviously went to go look for her, and he even started to realize that he may have feelings for Kazuo as well. When Koichi first encountered B-Pop, she defeated him so easily. Not only did she defeat him, but she showed her black tongue, which indicated that she was on trigger, as she told him that she hated him. I know that Koichi has thick skin, but I know that had to hurt. To see a friend struggling and not be able to do anything to help her must have felt terrible. Quite a bit happens between that encounter and the final battle of this arc, so I apologize if my thoughts come off a bit disorganized after this. So Kazuo got officially registered as a villain because she committed a large-scale quirk-based crime, and I don't know how I feel about this. It's implied that being designated as a villain is a really big deal, and it was later shown that because she had that designation, that basically gave Endeavor the green light to burn her to ash. On one hand, I thought it was cool that everyone was taking her as a serious threat that needed to be exterminated and only Koichi could truly save her. On the other hand, it seemed to me as if the authorities were really incompetent to label her as a villain after her first offense. They know that drugs like Trigger exist and it causes people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. Also, there is a quirk registry that contains everyone's quirk information, so they should know that she doesn't have the ability to create exploding bees. The police and detectives should have had enough information to know that there was something deeper here, but instead they made it okay for heroes like Endeavor to kill her on sight. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that it seemed like the law enforcement was more incompetent than they should have been, but I understand why they did it. 
because like I said earlier, they wanted to increase the stakes and make it so that Koichi was the only one who could save her. Soga came back in this arc and I honestly didn't think we would ever see him again, especially not in an important role. He actually baited us as he dressed up just like Knuckle Duster did, so in one panel I actually believed that Knuckle Duster was back. We still don't even know if he's alive since he hasn't been seen by anyone for 3 years, which is when he fought number 6. We have to get some answers as to what happened to him at some point, right? I feel like we will once or if his daughter ever comes back into the picture. But anyway, the letter he left Koichi was epic. For starters, we got official confirmation that All For One was the one who took Knuckle Duster's quirk. He told Koichi that he lied when he told him that he could make him a hero because he was already a natural born hero. He is similar to Deku in All Might in a way since he rushes in to help others without even thinking about it. It was just a really cool motivational letter that makes me miss Knuckle Duster even more. Of course, Koichi agreed to help since neither the cops nor the pro heroes could actually help her. It had to be done by a vigilante and a friend, perhaps something more. I liked the little training arc done to prepare Koichi for his battle ahead. It wasn't long and it wasn't like Koichi was learning some new skill. It was honestly just mostly a flex on his part as he was showing off how truly skilled he was. I don't even think it would be accurate to call it a training arc as it was more of a planning and analysis arc. One of the interesting things that we learned was that Koichi cannot hit people with his Shurigo Blam due to some subconscious interference. Another interesting thing that I learned was that Koichi scaled his Shurigo Blam's power based on Kazuo's face. I remember in a previous review, I said that I did not like that she wasn't allowing him to use his technique because it seemed like she was just restricting his growth. Now my opinion on that has completely changed because it has become relevant to the overall story. Koichi using Kazuo's face as a scale implied that he needed her in his life, which somewhat brings us back to the explicit romantic tension from the beginning of this arc. The final battle, or should I say, the final performance, almost made me cry. These characters who I was already emotionally invested in were put in serious danger. I really didn't have as much to fear about Koichi's safety as I did about Kazuo's safety if I am being completely honest. It's not like I care about her more or anything, it's just that she had no control over her body and actions while Koichi had complete control over his. I trusted that he knew what he was doing, but I couldn't say the same about Kazuo. And one thing I want to say before I move on is that I really think that this needs to be animated. I know I say that quite a bit, but I would really like to see this arc get some justice. It is implied that the explosions are part of the music B-pop played, but it's difficult for me to imagine what it would have sounded like. A pre-redemption arc Endeavor showed up to take care of the situation, which was probably the worst case scenario as he doesn't have a problem with killing villains, even if they are minors. Not only that, but he was even willing to take down the crawler too since he couldn't see the difference between vigilantes and villains. He was the number 2 hero for a reason, and I believe that reason was because he had the most villain takedowns out of any other hero even All Might. Needless to say, he was a huge threat. I remember when I was reading and I saw all of the pro heroes who came to stop B-Pop, I thought to myself, as long as someone like Endeavor doesn't show up, I think everything will turn out just fine. Then just my luck, he actually showed up. At first I thought, it was a crazy coincidence, but then I realized that this was just good writing. There was literally only one character whose presence could increase the stakes, so he actually showed up. I think it was chapter 81 where we get to see Kazuo's hypothetical dream fantasy where she actually was able to marry Koichi. It was so wholesome and it felt like I got a sneak peek of her deepest desires. It seemed like in her current state she had to give up on that dream and resign herself to death. She was obviously hurting, which is why it was good that Koichi was there for her. I really liked that when he reached out his hand for her, she briefly was able to come to her senses because once again it confirmed that she really did want to be saved. She didn't want to actually die. These were the dreams of a madman, more specifically of number 6. Let's talk about number 6 for a second. I noticed that I hardly ever mentioned him in my reviews despite the fact that he has had a presence in this story since the Versus Queen B arc. I don't know why it took me so long to realize this, but number 6 is actually the perfect villain for Koichi as they both have mobility quirks. However, it seemed to me that number 6 may actually be quicker. I believe that he will prove to be a more difficult challenge for Koichi to overcome in upcoming arcs. Not to mention, number 6 has a fascination with Knuckle Duster while Koichi is his actual student. I feel like there are many connections between them so it makes sense that they would end up butting heads. Overall, I guess you could say that I really loved this arc. It was definitely my favorite one so far, but there are two arcs left. One of them may just top this one. Who knows? I feel like a lot of my criticisms were addressed in this arc because we finally got more focused on vigilanteism. 
Koji had to do things that pro heroes and police would be unwilling to do, which ties this back to the overall theme of the manga. There were also some repercussions for Koichi being so nonchalant with his secret identity as he rarely wears his mask. I also really liked that this arc ended with Koichi camping out on top of a hospital. He knew that he should take number 6's threat seriously since he had an obvious intent to kill. He would do anything to protect Kazuo, even if it meant living on a rooftop for who knows how long. The Soga gang were also doing their part as well by making sure that no one sketchy was entering the hospital, not even journalists. I just can't wait to see where the story goes from here. Will Knuckle Duster end up returning? Will number 6 finally be taken down? I guess the only way to find out is to keep on reading. If you like this video, consider watching another one. I talk about a variety of different topics on this channel, mostly my hero right now, so I hope to see you there. This has been the Hot Rodster. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.